Today, I really felt like the Lord put it on my heart, and, uh, and it was confirmed that uh, this message, I think, is for this moment, for this time. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about right thinking. How should we think during these times? This is uh, unprecedented times that we live in. It's not unprecedented in history, but it is unprecedented in our lifetime. The church's response through the ages literally changed the course of history. The early church, when they were faced with these kind of things, they did not deny the plague exists. They did not look at the plagues as something that were God's judgments against sinners. They simply looked at these as opportunities and moments that they could serve and share the love of Christ. And because of that, literally, the world was changed. You could literally see a, a change in the demographics from the times that the plague start the size of the church until the time after the incredible growth of the church because the church decided to serve and to give glory to God through difficult times. I want to read this morning, begin in Acts chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 16. I know it's a little long, but we can all read this together as you're at home you just open up your Bible and let's read along together. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. It was about this time that Herod, uh, about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with the approval of the Jews, he seized Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Just like this time in the early church, you find that any time there's difficulty, that there's challenges, it tends to drive the church to prayer. And uh, this is a great moment. Many of you who are shut inside, many of you who can't get out on your routine, to remember that this is a God moment that we can spend more time praying for one another, that we can spend time praying for health officials and doctors and nurses who are on the front lines, praying for those who are afflicted by this virus. Let's make sure that we spend this time in prayer together. Verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get up quick, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards, came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. They went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to him himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When, his hand, when, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, when many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. So the question we have today is, what is it that surprises you? What is it that astonishes you? The astonishment for the early church was that God chose to deliver Peter. It wasn't astonishment that he was in prison. It wasn't astonishment that James was beheaded. The surprise was that God chose to deliver. The response of Peter and the church tells us a lot. Remember, James has just been beheaded, and I'm sure they're praying when James was taken captive. Surely they were praying when Stephen, the first martyr, was killed. I'm sure some of them were out on the fields when Jesus was being crucified, him looking up and praying 
for God to send down his angels to deliver. They believed in the power of God to deliver, but circumstances seemed to be pointing to Peter also dying. The surprise for the Peter and the church was that God chose to deliver. They accepted that death and suffering were a part of life were those who follow Jesus. What surprises us today is not good things, it's usually bad things. You know, many times we are like the friends of Job, that as soon as bad things happen, we assume you must have sinned. You must have done something wrong. There must be something wrong in your life. Whenever bad things happen to us, we often ask, why me? Why do bad things happen to me? Can you imagine how much different our lives would be if the emphasis of the why was changed? That it was not, God, why me, that bad things happen, but that we began to have an attitude of gratitude to say, God, why me? Why have you been so good to me? That in spite of all the pain in this world, despite of everything happening, you are with me. I have your peace. I have your joy. I have your life. I have eternal security in you. God, we have you in our lives. The why me of gratitude. Yes, Lord, thank you. Why me? Why have you been so good to me? Oftentimes, I'm afraid we sanitize the scriptures to minimize the parts we don't like. If any of you are reading from an NIV Bible, you will see that the header for this passage of Scripture says this, Peter's miraculous escape from prison. Is that what your Bible says? Peter's miraculous escape from prison. So what does this tell us? James was the first apostle to die as a martyr, and he doesn't even get a headline. The NIV simply points to escape. It is interesting what this tells us about modern thoughts about God. We believe that life becomes progressively happy, joyous, and prosperous to those who follow Christ. You have often heard it said, the safest place in all the world is the center of God's will. Tell that to Jesus as he followed the Father to the cross. Tell that to Stephen as he was being stoned to death. Tell that to James as he was being beheaded. This is not the example of Christ in whom's footsteps we follow. Life is not safe for those who follow Jesus, but it is the best place in the world to follow Jesus. Timothy Keller said this, the basic premise of religion, that if you live a good life, things will go well for you, is wrong. Jesus was the most morally upright person who ever lived, he had a life filled with the experience of poverty, rejection, injustice, and even torture. So why is this so important? While these kinds of attitudes may be debatable as tolerable, yet not ideal for the American church in times of ease and prosperity, it woefully hinders us in our response to difficult times like this. It is completely at odds with the required commitment for anyone I or a day who will take the gospel to the ends of the earth during these difficult times. For those dealing with the current situation related to the virus, fear and uncertainty can lead us to inward, not outward focus, to seek to save our life at all costs. One of the problems in the church today is our theology, our thoughts about God. We think that God's chief purpose is our happiness, prosperity, health, and comfort. Our thoughts give no place to the cross. Suffering, pain, and sacrifice are not acceptable. Yes, God does love us and care for us, but the chief purpose of life is bringing salvation to all people, to glorify the name of Jesus, to make him famous in all the earth. In the 17 and 1800s, there were so many people that were illiterate that were coming to follow Jesus that they created catechisms to help people to understand the doctrines of the church. One of the first catechisms is called the Westminster Catechism, and it starts with this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So how was it that the early church expanded and changed their world? I want you to listen to their thoughts about God. Paul articulates the mindset of Christ's followers 
throughout his writings. In Philippians 1.29, Paul writes, It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. He wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.8, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. When Paul looks back on his life and wants to describe for people what it was like to be an apostle, what it was like to follow Jesus, in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. And then listen for his use of the word danger. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. When he describes his journey with Christ, it it doesn't seem like an easy road. It's a dangerous road. Following Jesus does not make our life easier today. Following Jesus does not mean that we're free from worries of pandemics and violence and persecution. Following Jesus does not make our life safe. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is getting ready to go to Jerusalem. And when he's talking, here's what he says. And now, behold, verse 22 of Acts 20. I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. I don't know about you, but, but if I'm in my time of prayer and the Spirit of God says to me, you're going to go to a city, and when you get there, they're going to throw you in prison. I don't know about you, but my response probably would be, thank you, Jesus, for the warning. I'm not going to that city. Because surely God doesn't want me to be in prison. Surely God doesn't want me to face difficulty. But listen to the response of Paul, and and you will know why Paul was a man used by God to plant the church all over the world. You will know why Paul was a man used by God to see the kingdom established. Verse 24, but I do not count my life of any value nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. It is only when we as a people make a fundamental decision that the chief purpose of my life is to bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the mindset that changes the world. The mindset that says that God is chiefly interested in my health, my happiness, my safety, my security will always keep us from going to the place of bringing glory to God. Later, Paul is going to another city and literally a prophet comes to him and warns him. He takes off Paul's belt and ties himself up in his belt and said, this is what the Spirit says is going to happen to the man who wears this belt when he gets to Jerusalem. And all the believers come to him, and they start to weep and to cry, and they beg Paul, don't go, it's dangerous. Maybe some of you in the health profession have family members who are telling you, don't go to work today, stay away. Pastors who are being told, don't do your ministry now. There are many fears out there. But Paul's response is this, Acts 21, 13. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. We need people today who will challenge the self-preservation mentality that is so prevalent in the church. Peter also reflects these same kind of ideas. In 1 Peter 2.21, Peter writes to the church, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He writes later in chapter 4, verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised. Remember we talked about the surprise of difficulty, how it catches us off guard. And even the early church had this same fundamental challenge. They were surprised. Why are difficult things happening? But Paul writes to them, friends, do not be surprised 
at the fiery ordeal that has come on you as to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. And I want to say to you today, rejoice. Rejoice inasmuch as you will participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. The glory of Christ is going to be revealed. We are going to enter into our eternal reward. And in that place, there will be no more tears. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more sorrow. This is the promise of God for us. Verse 14, he said, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and God rest on you. But it wasn't just the apostles. In the second and third century, the church was responding to pandemics and plagues that were, that were abounding during that era. One of the early historians wrote this, The early church was no stranger to plagues, epidemics, and mass hysteria. In fact, according to both Christian and non-Christian accounts, one of the main catalysts for the church's explosive growth in these early years was how Christians navigated disease, suffering, and death. The church's posture made such a strong impression on Roman society that even pagan Roman emperors complained to pagan priests about their declining numbers, telling them to step up their game. In A.D. 249 to 262, there was a plague that was killing. It is estimated more than 5,000 people every day in Rome alone were dying from the plague. One of the church fathers who was there, he wrote this, Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. It is estimated in A.D. 250 that there were roughly 1.2 million Christians in all the world, which is an amazing thought to think of the few who were gathered in the upper room that within a few short centuries that there were 1.2 million. That represented roughly 2% of the population. By A.D. 300, in one of the darkest times in history, when, when plagues and academ epidemics were, were decimating the land, by A.D. 300, it is estimated there were 6 million Christians, 8% of the entire population. Why? Because of a people who decided to glorify God in the midst of difficult times. They did not hide from danger. They embraced the life of Christ. They embrace the path of Christ. Martin Luther, who uh, was one of the great theologians of the church, lived during the time of the bubonic plague. He actually wrote a short paper called this, Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. Luther provides a clear articulation of the Christian epidemic response. His response was this, we die at our post. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregation. The plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them to crosses on which we must be prepared to die. Now Luther was very clear that a man, a woman, a father, a mother taking care of their family should take care of their family. But on those to whom responsibility has been given, to those on whom duty lies, we have to stand and follow Jesus. All of these were simply following the example of Jesus, who left the joys and comforts of heaven to come and suffer with us. He experienced pain and separation so that we could have life. Jesus did not reveal the glory of God to us by coming and living separately from us. He came and showed us the glory of God and revealed to us who God is by experiencing our suffering with us. And in the same way, if Jesus is going to be revealed in the world today, it is not going to be revealed by Christians who are immune from pain and immune from the disease. It is revealed by Christians who joyfully walk through the pain with the world. 
through Christians who joyfully endure with the world as the world endures. In John 16.33, Jesus gives us this, uh, this, this sure stance. He said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus shows us something about suffering that we often miss. In Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And listen to this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy Set before him, he did not, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He endured with joy. Why? Because he knew he was in the center of the will of the Father. He knew that the experience of the cross was only for a moment. It was a short time but he would soon return to the place of joy and fulfillment in the presence of the Father. And that is the promise that we have. That is the joy with which we can serve the Lord today. That even if we're sick today, even if we're dealing with lack and suffering today, we have the right mindset that Christ is with us, that Christ is our all, and that through Christ we will receive our reward. This is how Peter was able to write to the church and say, Rejoice when we participate in the sufferings of Christ. When we face hardship, suffering, persecution, and pain, and lack, the Lord comes close to us. You remember Stephen, the first martyr of the church, as the stones were raining down and he was close to death. It says he looked up and said, I see Jesus, and he's standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And I want you to know today that if you're suffering today, if you're in pain today, that Jesus is standing and watching over you today. He's not sitting back casually. He is standing up. He is reaching out. He is with us in the midst of our pain. He has experienced pain with us. He is there for us to walk us through with joy and peace. Paul and Silas, when they were in prison, I often took Paul and Silas singing in prison as, wow, I wish I was as strong as Paul. But it wasn't the strength of Paul and Silas that caused them to sing in prison. It was the fact that when we walk through difficult times, Jesus walks nearer to us. In James chapter 4 and verse 6, he says this, but he gives us more grace. And I want you to know today that when we walk through difficult times, he gives us more grace. He comes closer to us. He shines his face on us. And that is how we can walk through difficult times with joy because Jesus comes close to us in our time of difficulty. He is the one who walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death. Dionysus, who lived through the plagues of, uh, of A.D. 249, said this, Other people would not think this a time for festival. But far from being a time of distress, it is a time of unimaginable joy. He was living in Rome at that time with 5,000 people a day dying. To be clear, Dionysus was not celebrating the death and suffering that accompany epidemics. Rather, he was rejoicing in the opportunity such circumstances present for testing our faith to go out of our way to love and to serve our neighbors, spreading gospel hope in both word and deed in times of great fear. I want you to know today, you don't fight on your own. We are not alone today. Rejoice today. Christ is near you today. So let me just give you just a few short thoughts of things I think that are important for us to walk through this academic. Number one, when everything seems to be changing, Remember, nothing really changes. The Lord never changes, and he is in control. Your call is unchanged. Your security is unchanged. Your provider is unchanged. Your healer is unchanged. Trust in the God who never changes. Circumstances change, but God never changes. 
Number two, wash your hands, but after that, go out and wash some feet. And when you come home, wash your hands again. Put on a mask, but also give someone else a mask. Find ways to serve, connect, and encourage through social media. Help an aging neighbor who shouldn't be getting out. Live life with patient endurance. Abide by government orders to help slow the spread of the virus. Live your life every day to glorify Jesus, not just save yourself. Number three, God uses these times to search us. He knows who we are, but we live in the dark. Plagues, pandemics, pain, they search us. They discover in us either the way of the flesh, self-preservation, or the way of the spirit, self-giving sacrifice. Let us allow the Lord in the coming weeks to search us and to try us and reveal to us areas that we need his grace, that our responses would not be in fear, in uncertainty, but we would have the certainty that comes with those who follow Jesus. Lord, search our hearts, try us, and know us. Number four, self-righteousness is the worst sin we can commit in these times. We all have to make difficult choices. The worst thing that we could do is to judge others on their choices during these times. Each one of us will answer to God. Give grace to one another, not condemnation. Encourage one another. Don't knock one another down. And finally, verse 5, the world's foundations are being shaken. The economy is crumbling under the weight of shutdown. Supplies are becoming scarce. Hospitals are reaching capacity. Fear and uncertainty is unleashing a plague almost as deadly as the virus. But Jesus is the cornerstone, the rock, our foundation that cannot be shaken. Point people to Christ. He is the answer in these dark times. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today that you don't just tell us what to do. You showed us what to do. You lived a life giving glory to the Father in the middle of difficult times. You endured the cross. You scorned its shame so that we could have life. And today, Lord, we pray that you would help us to think like you. Pray that you would help us to live like you, to give glory to your name. Jesus, we bless you today. We thank you that you are near to us. Let us go out and serve in our world with great joy, with peace, with rejoicing that you are with us. And we thank you today in Jesus' name, amen.